We're going to start now. Thank you everyone for coming. Special thanks to Evan and John for presenting for us today. Um, I'll let them present themselves, but I'll just say that they're the authors of a new book called Blockchain Success Stories, and I'll let them take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for having us today. We are uh, excited to be here with you. <clears throat> I am sharing my screen now. Can you give me a heads up or thumbs up? We've got a good screen share here. Yeah, we got it. Great. What an exciting time to be in technology. And blockchain is the most exciting technology to be in. Uh, if you're thinking of pursuing a career in blockchain development or programming, this is the best time to get involved. So we're going to share with you today what we've learned about how to build successful blockchains based on the 10 success stories that we researched for our book, Blockchain Success Stories. I'm John Hargrave. Uh, I'm calling to you today from uh, outer space, as you can see behind me, and my co-author Evan Karnapakis is calling from planet Earth, and uh, we'll be sharing this today. This year has been so exciting in the blockchain industry. Bitcoin, which is the best known blockchain project, passed $50,000 in price and recently passed $60,000 in price. Uh, Tesla Motors has put one and a half billion of Bitcoin uh, in its corporate treasury, basically in its kind of corporate savings account. Uh, Coinbase, uh, the leading crypto exchange, just went public last week uh, on the NASDAQ exchange. And there's just a flood of companies suddenly realizing that they need to get involved in Bitcoin and in blockchain as a larger industry. So we've reached this tipping point uh, from Bitcoin being kind of weird and fringy to really going mainstream. Blockchain is, of course, the underlying technology behind uh, all this Bitcoin, crypto, and digital assets. And uh, just to explain it simply, if you're new to this space, I'm going to turn it over to Evan to explain how we think about blockchain. So if you think of the internet that you have come to know over the last quarter century as an internet of information, that as it became scalable, that information could be sent or shared in a manner that was free, instantaneous, and trusted, well, then you can think of blockchain as an internet of value. Now, the first thing of value on that platform was Bitcoin. This was soon followed by altcoins or alternatives to Bitcoin, but really just about any asset that has value can be tokenized. This could be a half a million dollar piece of real estate that could be turned into $500, $1,000 tokens that then once issued can be transferred, thus democratizing the industry and opening it up to a wider range of investors. It could be a physician's medical credentials. These no longer need to be sent by a paper by the issuing institutions. They can be stored on a wallet and then they can be verified by a blockchain. Or you could have collectibles of your favorite celebrities, which is currently dominating the headlines now. But if you truly want to understand the full potential of blockchain, it all starts with Bitcoin and its fascinating origin story. Yeah, so you probably you probably know about this, uh, the famous origin story of this mysterious programmer named Satoshi Nakamoto, who changed the world with this short white paper describing a new kind of peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system called Bitcoin. And there's a few pieces of this that are really, really critical to understand as, uh, as developers and computer science majors. First of all, it's cash. So it is shared value. Now, other types of electronic cash had been tried before this, but Bitcoin did it differently and Bitcoin is the one that ended up succeeding. 
It was based on computer code. So what we call smart contracts behind the scene or how all of blockchain is handled using uh, instead of contract between two humans, between two computers. And finally, it was peer to peer. So uh, that means it was without a central bank, uh, what we call decentralized. So if you think of a like peer to peer file sharing platform, for example, Bitcoin would be similar. Uh, we would be able to transfer this money freely between us instead of having to go through some central institution or organization. So uh, Satoshi didn't get much recognition uh, when, when this was first published, but uh, like any good developer entrepreneur went back, uh, started building it himself and then started uh, attracting a small group of Bitcoin believers who started not only building it out, but trading it among themselves. And at the beginning, Bitcoin was only worth a few fractions of a penny. But over time, that grew and grew and grew. And today, as we said, it's uh, over $60,000 per Bitcoin. But then something really crazy happened, which is Satoshi vanished and left behind uh, over 1 million Bitcoin, which today would be something like $65 billion in Bitcoin. And that is so remarkable that someone would create such a world changing innovation and never come back to claim it, that it has become part of the Bitcoin origin story. And part of what makes it so appealing is that we don't know who exactly invented Bitcoin. It's really important because stories matter. Stories stick. Stories are how we remember information. So our first best practice from the book, we have 10 best practices. And the very first one is have a good origin story. When you're building a new product, even as a developer, start to think about how that product developed and what was your origin story, because that's how you're going to get people interested in your project, perhaps attract investors later on and get them to join you in this movement that you're building. So when O'Reilly Media approached us about writing a book of blockchain case studies, we were excited by this because when John and I were earning our MBAs, we found the case study method to be an effective way to teach business concepts in a manner that was both relevant and memorable. But when we started uh, researching case studies, what we found was that these were really just um, either barely beyond the white paper phase or just blue sky ideas that were far too early to be considered successes. And when there was that rare actual blockchain success story, it really wasn't a case study. It was more or less just a report. Here's the business, here's the technology, here's what happened. What we wanted to do was utilize the method of the Harvard Business School case study, in which the reader is immediately dropped into a dilemma. And then from the perspective of the protagonist, they have to analyze the situation, evaluate the options, and then at the end, the reader is asked, what would you do next? But we also wanted to add in our own special flavor and make it fun to read uh, much like a money ball or the big short, so that these stories would stick. And after we finished our 10 case studies, we then came up with 10 blockchain best practices that could be applied across a variety of industries. And in fact, we vetted these best practices in our own consulting work uh, with businesses and governments, because we're not just um, writers and educators about blockchain, we're also entrepreneurs and consultants who live blockchain every day. Yeah, so let's take you through a few uh, of these stories. We have three for you today. And the first one is this company called Helium. Uh, this is Amir Halim, and this is Sean Fanning. Sean Fanning was the co-founder of Napster, one of the earliest peer-to-peer -peer file sharing networks. And uh, they had an idea. Uh, they saw an opportunity as entrepreneurs to create a new kind of internet for the internet of things. Uh, and they've created this company called Helium. The idea is that this network of IoT devices uh, need basically a low power, low bandwidth connection to the internet. 
So think about things like temperature sensors, weather sensors, uh, smart pet collars, and so forth. They don't need 4G cell phone connections. Uh, they don't need high-speed internet. They just need to send a few packets of data a few times an hour. So they thought, how can we build a new kind of internet, a new infrastructure for this internet of things? Uh, and then Sean Fanning, who started his career at Napster, said, maybe we can get people to build it for us, kind of a peer-to-peer -peer version of the internet. And they created this thing called the Helium Hotspot. We're going to show you a quick video on how it works. We've all used Wi-Fi for stuff like this. <laughs> so adorable. And cellular data for stuff like this. Triaxolotl. Every day we connect to the internet. But it's not just people, from parking meters to packages, even these damn scooters. All these things should connect to the internet. Even this dog. Well, not the dog, but its collar. Seems like this little guy is lost. Luckily, he's got a smart collar on it. But that smart collar isn't so smart without the internet. Cellular data plans can be pricey. It's not like Sean could just log into this cafe's Wi-Fi real quick. Hey, I like your dog. Oh, it's not my dog, I'm just using him to demonstrate a point. What's your point? Glad you asked. Wouldn't it make sense for all of these things to have their own internet? A network that works just for them, so they could always stay connected anywhere, anytime. That's the kind of future I want to live in. And guess what? We can! With the Helium Hotspot. Honey, who's that? I'm the future. It's, uh, the future? The Helium Hotspot, the new kind of wire wireless device, where you and your community can create a network for the internet of things. So like a Wi-Fi router? No, it's long fi It reaches 200 times farther. But why would I? Why would you put this in your house? Glad you asked. Well, you're helping to power a better future for the city you live in, building a community of connectivity, making all sorts of things possible that aren't today, like helping you find lost things, connecting to things that can tell you when your food's expired. We've been powering sensors that help detect wildfires so people and their things can stay safe. What else? Isn't that enough? Yeah, Thinking about building a better future yeah, yeah. for children and your children. Well, for people who. Sorry about that. Can we see it? All good? Okay. Yeah, that. seems like it's all right. Yeah. Seems like someone unmuted. Sorry for okay, that. Okay, great. No problem. We're almost done. Here we go. Care about that sort of thing? You get rewarded Helium tokens, a cryptocurrency as a thank you for building the network and enabling devices to connect. So any more questions? Yeah. Whose dog is this? <laughs> yep. See, when the Internet of Things gets better, everything gets better. Even finding your dog. That's yours. Sean. <laughs> so that gives you an idea how uh, how this works, and uh, this helium hotspot. Uh, and uh, as you uh, just saw, they you buy one of these things and you plug it in, and it connects to other hotspots around you, uh, and you're rewarded with these helium network tokens for all of the. Uh, data or packets that you route through this hotspot. So it's kind of a citizen built mesh network using blockchain based cryptocurrency as a reward. I'll throw it to Evan here to talk more about the people's network. So this is a visual representation of the people's network showing the proliferation of hotspots throughout the United States. Now, when our book was published about four months ago, there were 11,000 hotspots. Today there are over 18,000 and there would be more if they weren't selling out. So why is it that these are selling out? What's the incentive to purchase a hotspot? Well, again, it's the opportunity to earn HNT or Helium Network tokens. Now, these are earned from doing real work. 
once they connect to other hotspots, they can validate them and earn tokens for this and then earn additional tokens for transmitting data over the network. Now, when we wrote this story about a year and a half ago, uh, the price of ATT was 13 cents. At the time of our publication, it was up to $1.30. Now it's consistently up over $7. So that is how you build out the supply side of the network. But what about the demand side? In other words, who is going to pay to then use this network? One example is a company like Lime. Lime is a scooter rental company that has scooters located throughout um, a city like uh, Austin, Texas, for example. And not only do they need to know where these scooters are located, they also want to know about the peak usage time. Um, further, um, because this is what we call a permissionless network, is they roam about the city for a few cents per month as opposed to a few dollars on a cellular network, um, they only need to be authenticated once. So as they go from hotspot, they do not need to be re-authenticated. And consistent with this permissionless philosophy is the idea of um, another key strategic decision was made, which was to, in fact, um, John, can you advance the slide? Yeah, you see this? Um, I'm still seeing the Helium Network token slide. We uh, should be... we we yeah. are seeing the yeah. other ones. Yeah, I think you're frozen there. Oh, Evan. there we go. Okay, yeah. now it popped up. Okay, sorry about that. So a key decision was made to open source everything, the hotspot, the sensor, and the software with the goal of it becoming a global standard. And the reason being, as Amir Halim said, the larger the network, the more valuable it becomes, which leads us to what we like to call the magic of open source. So this is a quote, Natalie Smolensky from another case study in her book called Learning Machine. It says, the magic of open source, you get some of the best programming talent and crypto talent in the world, all pulling their resources to solve a common problem, which then anyone can use as the infrastructure for the technologies that come next. Now, Learning Machine um, had a blockchain-based credentialing solution published under an MIT free and open source software license with the goal of becoming an industry standard. Why? Because this would future-proof their business, which leads us to our next best practice, which is to be as open source, decentralized, permissionless as it makes sense for you to be. Why? Because this will allow you to benefit from what we call in the book, blockchain network effects. The more users that you have, you'll have more people, talented people contributing to your system, making it more stable and secure, increasing the likelihood that you will become the industry standard, thus ensuring your long-term success. They also have a, a beautiful user interface. So uh, blockchain can be really geeky and hard to use. And um, most of the success stories in our book spent a lot of time uh, hiring product design people to make sure the user interface was really beautiful and easy to use. So that's our blockchain best practice number three. Um, hide the complexity of blockchain, kind of abstract it so that it is a beautiful, rich user interface. And I'm getting an echo on the line there. Yeah, there's a bit of echo. I think if you guys mute yourselves while the other is talking, it's probably better. So uh, our next success story is Crypto Kitties. And as Evan said, this whole uh, industry of NFTs or non-fungible tokens are getting uh, a lot of excitement right now. And this was the origin story of NFTs. It was literally... Uh, the very first NFT project. It was started by these two guys, uh, Mac Flavel and Roham Garagazalu. And uh, they had a design agency uh, that wanted to build a new blockchain collectible project. Uh, and this guy, uh, Mac Flavel, who was 
really funny. This the funniest guy that we interviewed for our book said, we're going to make a game where cats have sex on the blockchain. And uh, that's what they did. And it was so successful that it nearly took down the Ethereum network. And the story in the beginning of the book is Mac staying with his father uh, at his father's house. And he's walking up the stairs and he gets two uh, emails back to back. Uh, the first one says, we just sold our first crypto kitty for $40,000. And the second one says, the entire Ethereum network is going down. So our story is how they solved that crisis and uh, basically kept Ethereum afloat. This was so successful that uh, some of these crypto kitties even today are going for over $100,000. And basically what you're buying are these digital collectibles. Basically you're buying this graphic, <laughs> but the graphic has attributes, which they call catributes, that are like genetic attributes so that you can breed them with other cats um, and then buy, sell, trade the offspring as well as the original cat. Um, and to date, uh, they have sold over 700,000 crypto kitties uh, for a total price of something like $110 million. So uh, Evan, we'll talk a little bit more about <laughs> why this was such a viral success and what they did uh, to solve the crisis. So you can see from these two graphs that crypto kitties was driving all of the action on the entire Ethereum network to the point where they caused it to crash. Now, let's put this in perspective. It's not like you have this factory and you're running over time to uh, you know, meet uh, an urgent order, so you blow a fuse and the lights go out. No, you caused a citywide blackout. They crashed the entire Ethereum network at the height of the initial coin offering or ICO boom. So this was when new projects were minting their own money. People were becoming instant millionaires. And now they couldn't do it because of the silly cat game. So this was not just an issue of CryptoKitty's reputation or even Ethereum's reputation. This was really an issue of could the blockchain industry effectively scale? And this leads us to our next best practice, which is you need to build for scale, okay? Once you have your blockchain, scaling will be the biggest challenge that you will face. Okay? And what they did here in order to get past this crisis was um, in order to handle this, you know, the, the capacity that they had built, first they educated their users. They let them know why this was occurring, when the peak times were, and how they could be avoided. Then they added a simple button that enabled them to increase the gas price. That, that way they could pay more money for um, to have their transaction processed. From there, they added a technology called side chains to uh, reduce some of these blockages. But their ultimate solution was to, in fact, build a new platform with more capacity. And that platform is called Flow. And CryptoKitties has since been moved off of Ethereum and on to the Flow platform. Now, another. Um, a key aspect of business that CryptoKitties got right was their organizational structure. As they like to say, Mac was the kitty guy and this, uh, someone named Dieter Shirley was the tech guy. And on the kitty side, uh, on the marketing side, they clearly understood how to make cute cats, create an easy to use interface, and then viral marketing to create an epidemic of demand. On the tech side, the long lasting impact of CryptoKitties will be what is technically known as the ERC721 non-fungible token, fungible meaning the same, non-fungible meaning different, or what we commonly just refer to today as NFTs. And much like Satoshi Nakamoto and Vitalik Buterin before them, um, Dieter and three others started with a white paper. And this white paper eventually developed into one of the most robust and technically impressive smart contracts in existence. So just to then summarize, um, what happened was in this crisis, you had 
CryptoKitties, which was the application, working with MetaMask the Wallace, and Ethereum, which was the platform, along with other industry leaders like Infura and Grid Plus to solve this crisis. Which leads us to our next best practice, which is collaborate through communities and consortia. Okay? Again, one of the techniques that CryptoKitties use, which is a content marketing best practice and direct marketing best practices, was to create a community of these kit investors and then figure out a way to monetize that. Then they worked with other industry leaders to solve the crisis. Okay. Another example of this in our book is when fintech industry leaders Circle and Coinbase created the Center Consortium with the vision of USDC or the US dollar coin becoming a stable coin industry standard. And because they solved this uh, scaling issue, NFTs, uh, as we discussed, are exploding. You can go to a site like OpenSea. Dot io and uh, buy hundreds of thousands of NFTs, digital artwork, but also coin, like any kind of collectibles, uh, including virtual real estate, uh, sports collectibles. You may know about NBA Top Shot, which was uh, the next project by uh, Dapper Labs, the creator of, of CryptoKitties, and many, many others. So when we're done, we'll take questions and we're happy to answer uh, Happy to answer any questions you have about NFTs. But uh, finally, let us tell you about uh, our third success story, which is called Binance Charity Foundation. And this is uh, the founder, Helen Hai. Um, she grew up in China during the 1970s, which was uh, the, uh, the Chinese Industrial Revolution. And it was a very exciting time in the country. And uh, she was a, a girl, I think about eight or nine years old. Her, her father took her to uh, Shanghai's first uh, five-star hotel. <clears throat> and uh, while she was there, uh, they, they went into the lobby and her father asked the concierge uh, how much to stay here. And the concierge told him the price and her father said, it's too expensive. And they walked out. And uh, that moment really had an impact on Helen because as she turned and looked back at this ornate marble lobby, she thought to herself, that will never belong to me. Uh, because I am a Chinese girl, I will never have access to this kind uh, of, of lifestyle. Uh, and she thought about that many times as she went to college and then started a very successful uh, career in finance. How many other young Chinese girls uh, would also feel that they were locked out of these opportunities? Many years later, uh, she was at the uh, Davos uh, Financial Summit in Davos, Switzerland, when she met this guy, Cheng Peng Zhao, uh, who goes by CZ. This is the founder of Binance, uh, one of the most successful crypto exchanges in the world. And uh, just a very interesting entrepreneur. We, we, uh, we tell his story in the book as well. And uh, Cheng Peng said, uh, basically, I want to create a new kind of charity, uh, a charity arm of Binance. And uh, he asked Helen to lead it. And so together, uh, they created this uh, organization called the Binance Charity Foundation. And uh, we'll show you a quick video uh, on how this works. Uh, the, 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 the basic idea is it lets you donate cryptocurrency and then it gives it to charitable causes. But here's a, a specific charitable cause. My parents died in 2009 because of AIDS. Since then, I was brought up by my grandma. I was lucky to get sponsored and went to a primary school in Kampala. I made a lot of friends. We studied hard because we have dreams. Some of my friends have money to buy food, but only beans every day. 
The rest of us only drank water. I was hungry, but I still try my best to stay in class. More and more friends did not come to school anymore. We all have dreams, but with no food to eat, we had to give up our dreams. Now my friends are coming back to school. We play happily together. From I know, everyone of us gets donation to buy food in cryptocurrency. The money is used to buy fresh food. We have more than beans now. Our menu changes every day. I often come and help to cook. I want to pass on the help I received. I hope there will be no hunger in all of us. And we can all pursue our dreams. In Africa and around the world, hundreds of millions of kids are suffering from hunger and malnutrition. Finance Charity is dedicated to fostering hope through blockchain, providing transparency and donations, and making the world a better place. So a lot of people are talking about doing good uh, with, uh, with, with blockchain, and, and they're actually doing it. Nevin, I'll tell you a little bit more about how it works. So much like a Kickstarter campaign, you can select the charity that you wish to donate to with the added knowledge that Binance is working with directly with these local communities to determine their most best needs so that you can be assured that your donations are maximizing their impact. Further, okay, just as uh, Cheng Peng Zhao dealt with the regulatory issues surrounding money transmission by only accepting crypto instead of fiat, um, with Binance Charity Foundation, you can also make your donations in crypto. As a result, the end recipients receive crypto. Okay, This has the added benefit of empowering them in this new world of fintech. In many cases, this is actually banking the unbanked. Example of this could be enabling them to obtain micro loans to start small businesses or in countries with uh, high rates of inflation, they could purchase inflation resistant stable coins. Okay. And this go ahead and leads us to our next best practice, which is to eliminate the intermediaries. Okay. By using smart contracts to cut their overhead and reduce their administrative costs, Finance Charity Foundation enables more money to go directly to the end recipients while still providing complete transparency so you know where your donations go and the added knowledge that be, by donating directly to the end recipients, they're also building connections with them so they can really address their most pressing needs. Yeah, and we'll tell you about it. I was just gonna add um, another case study in our book that illustrates these principles is Everledger which was founded by Leanne Kemp. This company uh, had a focus on conflict-free diamonds and by providing provenance, meaning the origin and complete history of that product through its movement through a supply chain, um, they were able to then have efforts that led to positive social impact, environmental stability, and empowering women and the poor. Yeah, and we'll just tell you quickly uh, how this uh, Binance Charity Foundation works with a partner uh, in, uh, let's say, Africa. So um, there's uh, one project where the Binance Charity team noticed that many young women were often missing school. And when they asked, they found that menstruation is still a stigma in many African villages. Uh, young women may not have access to feminine products or they may not know what's happening to their bodies. Sometimes uh, women are still asked to leave the village during their monthly cycle. So Binance Charity Foundation partnered with a local uh, nonprofit called AfriPads. 
Afropads goes into uh, schools and basically explains to young women how the body works. And then they distribute these reusable cloth pads. These pads are created by women in villages. So it creates local jobs. It helps the African economy. Um, and it gets uh, them to women who need them which is tremendously empowering and also helps break this generational cycle of shame, which leads to missed school, which leads to missed opportunities. And women are now uh, earning money for participating in this business as well. But how do you do this? How do you go from Bitcoin <laughs> to feminine pads? How do you convert this to this? So the answer was very clever. They create uh, something called the Pink Care Token. This looks complex, but basically the young woman has a coupon on her mobile phone, and then she goes into a local shop. And that coupon, which is basically like a QR code, uh, everyone has a mobile phone pretty much. So this QR code on her mobile phone, she scans it at the shop, the shopkeeper has a supply of these uh, cloth pads, gives her the pads and redeems the coupon, which can then be redeemed back into Bitcoin in the shopkeeper's digital wallet. Uh, and it's a little bit uh, in the US, we have uh, food stamps uh, or other types of uh, coupons. Uh, that are used to uh, help those of, of lower income. It's a similar idea. We call this crypto coupons, taking cryptocurrency and turning it into a real world physical good. Uh, so very clever little case study. So Helen High uh, started out thinking that these young women would never have opportunities. And today she's creating these opportunities uh, for an entire generation of young women. So it's a very inspiring story uh, that, that we think you'll, you'll love. And it brings us to our uh, seventh best practice, which is stick to your vision, follow your passion, look for the thing you're excited about and see how blockchain can make that possible. Finally, I'll read from our first chapter, which explains where we think uh, we're going with this blockchain industry. Uh, we're building the world that we'll be living in tomorrow. And today we have a world filled with get rich quick schemes and quick payout unicorns where 1% control 99% of the world's wealth. But where we're going is a future that's smarter, greener, and fairer, a world where we can send value where it's most needed, where the pie is sliced more evenly, where everybody has access to this internet of value and the power to use it. And that's because humans in the end are what matter. As computer science students, rem remember that technology serves us, not the other way around. And so in our book, we tried to tell human stories, stories of vision and courage and resiliency, our best human qualities. And we hope that you'll take those qualities in the technologies that you're building uh, throughout your career, and you'll use them to make the world better. So we set up our book so that the first uh, three chapters, we begin by covering what is blockchain through the Nakamoto origin story, then blockchain building blocks uh, through the story of Vitalik Buter and launching Ethereum, and then blockchain principles to the story of Changpeng Zhao and Binance. Um, but this ultimately, uh, from there, we went ahead and have our 10 different chapters of case studies across a variety of industries, followed by our 10 best practices. So now let's move on to our final best practice, which is consistent with why we are all here today. And that is educate, educate, educate. Okay. Once you have built your blockchain, 
Your two biggest challenges will be making people aware of your blockchain and then getting people to use your blockchain, both of which involve comprehensive education. And you can read more about this blockchain education in our chapters on the Chamber of Digital Commerce, which is the trade association for the blockchain industry. So education is what they do, as well as our own work providing education to the government of the state of Massachusetts. We then chose to conclude our book with the teacher's guide for how to best use the book in the classroom setting. But we don't just teach about blockchain. Uh, we're also blockchain learners. And we are excited by our opportunity to have a conversation with you, our audience today, so that we may learn from you in our upcoming Q&A session. All right, so with that, uh, we'd love to take any questions from all of you uh, that you might have about blockchain, any of the stories we talked about today, or anything else that's going on in the blockchain, Bitcoin, or crypto world. Be brave. Don't be afraid to ask the first question. Hello? Hi. So I have a question. I've been in the crypto world for around a year and a half now, and I would like to be like more involved. I have some knowledge Calling, but then, and I I would like to to go deeper into into blockchain. So, what would you recommend to someone that knows the basics of coding but has hasn't gone ever into blockchain? Um, so you were breaking up a little bit, but I think your question is uh, you 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 want to go into blockchain potentially as a career. And you've learned a little bit about the basics of coding, but want to know where to go next. Is that right? Um, yes, close enough. <laughs> Evan, what do you think? Do you have an answer? Sure. I mean, I think the, the first step is just look for uh, communities to get involved in. You know, one of the great things about um, this industry right now is that because it is new um, and it's growing, um, there are no gatekeepers. People are not trying to hold on to their own small silos. There is an ecosystem there. And the more we get involved with it, the more we communicate, um, the more that we're actually making the pie bigger for everyone. Uh, so the best thing that, that you can do is really just jump right in, start getting involved, start meeting people, look for opportunities. Um, you know, is uh, you know, I remember very early on we said uh, what, one of the key issues in determining whether or not uh, any blockchain project is viable is actually having the people that are there to develop it. I mean, we actually used the story once that uh, you know people who are skilled in blockchain technology they're they're like wizards because they're they're in great demand and the demand for blockchain um, skills, especially on the cutting side. Um, is the demand is greater than the supply right now. So really, I mean, just participating in more events like this, talking to people, uh, making connections. Uh, the other great thing is because this is a new and emerging industry, people will, will make the time to talk to you. Um, we're always amazed at, you know, just like some of the, the people that we interviewed for our book, uh, because it's a growing industry, uh, when you reach out, I think you'll be surprised uh, how many people will respond to you far more so than traditional established yeah. Uh, learn Solidity, programming language. Uh, and then, as Evan said, go to meetups or other blockchain events, um, either online or in person when we have more in-person events. That's how we've learned everything. And, you know, those those meet, meetups are very important for building your your network and learning from other people. Does that help? Yeah, it does help a lot. And um, one follow-up question would be uh, about Solidity. Like, I've looked for documentation, but uh, any specific place that you would uh, recommend? For learning Solidity? Yes. Uh, no, I don't know, actually. Um, 
I'm just looking, I'm just Googling online. Uh, there is ethereum.org has a uh, Solidity course or set of tools. So, you know, Solidity is the language that's used for Ethereum to develop smart contracts. So, so I would start there, uh, maybe get involved with a, a, a Discord channel where you can ask questions of, of other Solidity developers and, uh, and start there. I just wanted to Thank you. quickly chime in. Yeah. Um, there's a website right. called Crypto Zombies. And, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, my connection's a bit spotty, but it's basically it teaches you how to clone, how to create a copy of Crypto Kitties and teaches you solidity along the way. So it's a pretty interesting way to learn. Yeah, so that's a real <laughs> project that could be quite valuable very quickly. <laughs> that's great. I didn't know that. Crypto zombies. Great. Other questions? I'll ask a question um, regarding a bit what you mentioned before. How do you think the approach maybe by universities and educators might approach blockchain? Because it's something so new, but you're starting to see like master's degrees in blockchain and stuff like that. How do you think it might get standardized per se? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, my son is in his first year at university and wants to go into computer science and was asking me the same question about whether he might be able to get a master's degree in blockchain. And I said, well, in three years, they'll probably have, <laughs> they'll probably have it. Um, it is evolving very quickly and uh, it takes time in colleges and universities. Um, Evan and I uh, have both worked on either side of the educational system and uh, it just takes time. But I think within the next few years, we'll start to see uh, development curriculums that are more standardized if you want to take the technical route. And we wrote our book from a business perspective because, you know, we have MBAs and that's how we look at it. So our book is really written, as Evan said, to be used um, in the classroom using this case study method where you're looking at real blockchain businesses and trying to analyze what, what they're doing well and, and what they might do next as, as they face these challenges. So um, within the next few years, I think we'll start to see real blockchain curriculum and majors uh, at, at a much larger level. And I think uh, one thing I had to add, um, just like within um, computer science information technology, you can have a degree in computer science or systems analysis, which is, is very technical, but then there's also majors and minors in what we would call management information systems, the business side, where you understand the technology, but you're not actually you know, <clears throat> fingers dirty at the code level. And I think you're going to see something like that too within blockchain is that there's going to be the, the computer science side, computing side, but there's also going to be a need for case studies, much like what is in our book so that business people can really understand the key issues and then interact with the technology people so they can all work together in a synergistic manner to achieve these solutions that the industry needs. Yeah, and I'll also point you to the Blockchain Education Network, uh, BEN, Blockchain Education Network. Uh, that was started by a group out of MIT and they have created a full blockchain curriculum for students who want to create their own student club. So you start out, for example, with you know purchasing your first Bitcoin, <laughs> and then you uh, they have a whole uh, program where you go on a uh, you, you learn to write a smart contract, and you go on a field trip somewhere to buy something with crypto. Um, it's very interesting and well done, and they have. I think a uh, hundred participating colleges and universities. So that's something you can do as students is join the blockchain education network and start to create more clubs uh, there at, at your local school. Thank you. I didn't know about the blockchain ed education. Network. It's great. Yeah. Run by a guy named Eric Pinos, who is great. I, I love him. 
All right, I'll check it out then. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll chime in. Um, so I'm coming more from not as much of a technical side, and I'm looking more into the investing these different like new blockchain technologies and these new projects. Right. So I've been on these like launch pads and poker starter trust oh, things like that. Do you have any recommendations on where I can get more into like contact with these blockchain like uh, like the teams behind these new blockchain projects? Because I, cause the, the team behind the project is what's really important and whether or not it works. Right. Uh, so, so you're looking to invest in early stage blockchain projects and want to learn more about their teams before you invest. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean on all these uh, launch pads, you, you only really get like their white paper and little information here and there. So I'd like to like, be in a position where I can be more interactive with the teams behind it. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. And we do a lot of writing and speaking about investing in blockchain. Um, and I am a member of a blockchain uh, angel investor group. And we met today actually and heard a pitch. It was like two hours from one of these early stage blockchain groups. So we talked with the founder and got to ask him lots of questions. Um, if you don't have access to that kind of, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, questions for the founder, you should at least ask for them to have a, a Discord or, you know, a Telegram group or somewhere where you can be asking questions of the team. But you're absolutely right that you do need to look at the team carefully. It's one of the most important things before you invest in a new blockchain project. And you really have to ask, you know, who are they? Uh, what is their experience? You know, do I have confidence in them building, being able to build a block, a successful blockchain project? So I would just make that a condition of investing that you are able to go at least behind the scenes on a private channel or something and, and talk with those investors. And uh, white paper. And Dean, a tool that could be very uh, useful for you would be the uh, Media Shower Investor Scorecard, uh, which is broken down into five categories. Um, you know, does the market justify the project? Uh, is there a sustainable competitive advantage? Uh, and then we do look in detail at the management team. Uh, and then we look at the tokenomics. You know, does it make sense? Is there a fixed supply or is it rewarded only for doing real work? And then last, we look at some issues of user adoption. Uh, but I think that will be very helpful for you to kind of come up with a way of evaluating multiple projects and deciding which ones that you would like to invest in. But again, I also think that you may be surprised as to, you know, if it was just a traditional, you know, IPO and you were trying to contact a company, you might, you know, not hear anything back. But I think you may be surprised at how many of these blockchain projects will have people that are very excited to talk to you and share their background and expertise but yes the, the management team is extremely important um yeah so that's called the blockchain investors scorecard and if you just google blockchain investor scorecard uh you'll see it and i would uh, drop a link in the chat but my chat is going to a different microsoft teams instance so <laughs> we'll We'll send that to Eric for a follow-up email to everybody. Yeah, no, I found it. You guys published it in the journal, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you found it. Thank you, guys. Sure, sure. Other questions? Well, Eric, looks like we're right at the uh, top of the hour here. So we did. We we tell yeah, time yeah, well. I just wanted to thank you guys. I just wanted to thank you guys again for coming. It was a very interesting talk and I think people really appreciated it. So yeah, yeah. thank you for helping everyone here learn. Well, we were happy to do it. Thank you for inviting us. We are really passionate about the space and we wanna encourage you guys to learn as much as you can. Evan and I are both available on LinkedIn. If you wanna connect with us on LinkedIn, you can easily message us afterward. Uh, and we, we try to be really responsive to that as well. All right. All right. Great. Great. Thank you so much.